Welcome to the Money and Wealth Show, brought to you this week by AmericanManganeseInc.com. Here's your host, Sterling Fox. Welcome to the Money and Wealth Show, the program that offers opinions every week on the markets, the economy, and business. And this week is certainly no exception. It's a real pleasure to welcome back British Columbia business analyst Michael Levy. Good to see you again. Thanks, Sterling. Good to have you on the program. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about. Michael, we're just a couple of days away from a federal election here in Canada that uh, is looking more and more every day like not much is going to change. Well, I think uh, maybe it will. I, I, I really think with the NDP coming up with their platform, uh, they're going to give the Liberals a run. The only thing uh, that is a run for that left of center vote, center left center vote. The thing that bothers me the most is that there's no buddy in all three parties being held accountable for the amount of money they're promising to spend whether it's the two and a half or three billion extra that the Liberals have put into their spending plans, up to 30 billion for the NDP. Right, right. And the Conservatives basically are promising, steady as she goes, we're going to try and balance the budget, but are they good stewards of our money? They got all the excesses, they got all the surpluses when times were good before 207, 208. And they spent them all, thinking that every voter would want them to spend instead of putting some away for a rainy day. So I'm not a political figure in my on-air life. I have my own politics. I know I'm a bit right of center mm -hmm. as far as economic politics are concerned. But the conservatives have to be held accountable. And the Liberals and the New Dems have to tell me where they're going to get the money to spend on all their promises. And, Sterling, when they say they're going to raise corporate taxes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is them then assuming that when we make a change, nothing changes. If you raise corporate taxes, then that changes the dynamics and doesn't necessarily mean you're going to collect the same amount in taxes when you take money away from a corporation that they can spend on staff, sure. salaries, expansion, marketing, research and development. Research and development. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, John Maynard Keynes said it best, when the facts change, I change. Well, in fact, the facts are changing but the federal politics aren't. One fact that is really annoying to me, and I'm sure bugs the heck out of you too, is this character flaw we share as a voting nation. We seem to be quite thrilled with the notion of voting for he or she who promises us the most. Even though it's all borrowed money because we're flat broke and, and seriously in debt, mm -hmm. we actually have, and you can trace this historically, we have a history of voting for those who promise us the most most lolly, even if it's all borrowed dough. Absolutely, and it's always the other guy should pay. Mm -hmm. Always, because you see, when you're promising me, I take it that I'm going to get it, but you're going to pay. It's never I pay. There was a poll in the United States, a Pew research poll, and they are probably the best polling group within the United States. And when they were talking about the budget deadlock and the fact should they increase the budget limit over 14.3, trillion dollars. Well, in fact, they have increased it because they finally got together at the 11th hour. Right. But the poll, 78% of Americans said, don't increase the budget level. In other words, do, do not go beyond the 14.3. Mm -hmm. They said, do not. But the second question was never asked. All right, if we don't, are you willing to take cuts? But that part of the question was never asked. And unlike what's happening in Europe now, particularly Western Europe, Britain at the moment, uh, Northern Ireland, Italy, Greece, somewhat in Spain, Portugal, they're actually cutting. They are actually cutting expenses. They're actually cutting program spending. We don't know anything about that here in North America. Though it didn't really look very much like a lot of spending was being spared yesterday at the royal wedding, uh, Michael. The Brits, you're absolutely right, are on quite an austerity program, and that's out of necessity. They really have no choice. And if that's the case, the question is, if the Brits are doing this because they have no choice, why isn't America doing it, given that they're in worse shape than the Brits? And here, I think, is one of the primary reasons. David Cameron had the intestinal fortitude, known as guts, to run on a platform of cuts. Mm -hmm. Now, the Brits don't like it. 
They have been out in the street. They're protesting. There has been uh, almost armed incursions in the street, not quite, but rock throwing mm -hmm. and a burning of automobiles. But the fact remains, Cameron ran on cuts. Our politicians don't have that intestinal fortitude. You look at Obama in the United States, and uh, we're going to start balancing the budget in nine years, 10 years, yeah. 11 years. Here in Canada, I've got to say Stephen Harper does have a plan. Now, I've got to also say that when you do the numbers, it doesn't come out that we balance in 214 or 215, but maybe in 216, and he's going to be within $100 million, according to uh, the, the, the numbers that have been put out there. So at least he is talking about balancing the budget, because the other two parties, though the NDP is saying we can balance, they are never going to be held accountable because they'll never be government. The Liberals, I don't know. There's certainly, I don't get the feeling either, Still, So Obama isn't doing anything now, Michael, because 2012 is an election year, and he's quite willing to postpone the hardship until he gets a second mandate to run the show. And then maybe postpone again after that, because to me there's been no proof of any kind that they want to stifle their spending habits, their earmarks that go into the budget that are the favorite projects of senators or Congress people in their different areas where they run sure. their, their constituencies. There, there's no sign of that whatsoever. And that you know, brings us to the U.S. dollar and why so many investors, so many major corporations and investment institutions, so many sovereign nations don't want to hold U.S. dollars anymore. And, and the reason they, they don't want to is because they're not being accountable for what they're doing. Right, and that's also impacted precious metals in a very significant way over the past few days. And we'll get to that in just a second. Our guest this week on the Money and Wealth Show, business analyst Michael Levy. Always a pleasure to have Michael pay us a visit. Lots more ahead. Stay with us. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. American Manganese Inc. has a world-class deposit in Arizona. Indicated 6.7 billion pounds. Inferred 8.9 billion pounds. Potentially the lowest cost producer of electrolytic manganese. American Manganese Inc. has a projected cash cost of 44 cents a pound. The metal trades near $2 a pound. Do the math. Trading symbol AMY. Visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 604-531-9639. You're watching The Money and Wealth Show, archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Here's your host, Sterling Fox. Welcome back to The Money and Wealth Show. Michael Levy, BC Business Analyst with Chorus Radio and Global Television, is our guest again this week. And Michael, we just before the break started talking about the U.S. dollar, and we really must pursue this. Not only because gold and silver have seen quite a remarkable week this past week, but also because the whole world is watching the United States of America. The American dollar is the world's currency, and a lot of people in the world don't want to touch it anymore. What well, do you see as the future of the greenback? Well, first of all, the U.S. has debased their currency and done it on purpose. From 2001, 2002, they proclaimed a strong dollar policy. They didn't mean it. So they've watched it go. And let's go in terms, Sterling, of Canadian dollars. Okay. Canadian dollar was worth 62 cents back in 2002. Today, around a dollar five. Yes. I mean, dollar four, dollar five, mm -hmm. dollar six. So if you take that and look at the U.S. dollar, it's gone from a dollar forty down to ninety-six and a half cents right. in basis of Canadian. Well, it's done that to the Australian. It's done it with the euro. It's done it, and you can go basically currencies around the world. So the U.S. has purposely taken their dollar down by design, so that when they pay back the money they've borrowed, they will pay back with dollars that are worth less. That's the problem in Europe. When you have nations of the euro, they cannot deflate their currency. And when they cannot do it, then they have to pay back at whatever the euro is worth on the world market. 17, 18 countries in the euro, they have no control over the currency. True, exactly. Isn't the danger, though, Michael, the gamble that America has taken by deliberately lowering the value of its dollar in order to pay less, essentially, at payback time? Isn't the gamble 
that interest rates might play against that. If global interest rates do rise, America is going to have to raise her rates eventually too. Could that not bite America hard? Absolutely, and that's the huge problem. A, there are less that want U.S. debt. Uh, let me give you a fact here. I think it's very interesting. If you were to ask those who follow the markets who the biggest holder of U.S. debt is, the automatic response is China. Yes. Second largest, Japan. And they've flipped in the last two years. Right. Wrong. Oh. In fact, the largest holder of U.S. debt is the U.S. Federal Reserve because of quantitative easing. Ah, okay. They have been the buyer of U.S. Treasuries, and they're buying more than China, more than Japan, obviously, post-earthquake, uh, sure. tsunami, they but would be. But is China the second largest? Holder? Yes, yeah. But, but America's way out in well, front. But now they are because they've been buying all their own. Okay. Uh, they always had debt, but now they've bought another $600 billion worth. Right. So the fact remains that the U.S. is the largest holder of their debt. As interest rates start to creep up because of global inflation, the U.S. may not want to raise interest rates because their economy is too fragile, sure. but they have to raise interest rates if the rest of the world goes. Otherwise, nobody will buy their debt. So they have to be competitive in order to sell their debt. So they do have a conundrum. But in the shorter term, the U.S. dollar could be very oversold. And just for those doom and gloomers, those who think that the world's coming to an end, those Armageddon people, that you have to have gold and silver and you can't own anything else, let me say the U.S. is still the world's largest economy, 10 times bigger than the second largest economy in the world. They are still the world's reserve currency. They still have every commodity in the world priced in U.S. dollars. Sure. So although some countries when trading commodities will trade in their own currencies. Now they're doing Instead yeah. of U.S. dollars, mm -hmm. it's not significant enough to even come close to budging one millimeter the U.S. dollar office perch. 30 years, 40 years, 50 years from now, there might be a basket of currencies that become the standard bearer. I don't think it's going to be one currency. I think China will be instrumental. It could be a basket of currencies. It could be a basket of commodities of what the world trades against. What I'm hearing, though, from a lot of these uh, pundits of doom is their lack of faith in all fiat currencies, be it the euro, the British pound, the Canadian dollar, the American buck. They think it's all potentially worthless. And they are the ones who will uh, advise the world to go out and buy gold and silver. And that said, you're, uh, over the years, uh, historically a proponent of owning some precious metals in one's portfolio. That's my business. But you're not a, a doomy gold bug kind of guy either, though, are you? No, I think everybody should hold some hard precious metals in their portfolio. Has to be. You must hold some as an insurance policy. 10%, 8%, sure. 12% in actual hard metal. But to say that the world's coming to an end Thursday and the guy with the beard and the flowing white robes with a sign, <laughs> uh, sorry, that, that doesn't cut it. And these people who are preaching Armageddon, all they have to do is look at history. History will repeat. We live in a world of cycles. And there will be a day that comes, maybe not in my lifetime, and maybe, young man, not in your lifetime, but it will come once again when gold will go down in value, sure. currencies will be back up and be partly standard, they might be backed by something, that the economies will improve, that the debt situation will come under control one way or the other, maybe very hard to do, maybe a 10 or 20 year job, but don't think that what's happening here now is new to this world. It's happened before, it will happen again. Well, very quickly here, just before we go to break, uh, are you concerned? that paper currencies, whether it's ours or anybody else's, has the potential to fail based on current world economic realities? The one that worries me the most is the euro. Okay. And the reason the euro quickly worries me is because you have some weak members of the community and sure. how do you um, equate Portugal with Germany? Mm -hmm. Or how do you equate Northern Ireland, well, this isn't Euro, but yeah, Euro, Northern Ireland mm -hmm. with France. I mean, you can't, where Canada equates with Canada, we have a Canadian dollar. Sure. U.S. equates with the U.S., U.S. dollar, etc. So there's where my worry is, is the Euro. Interesting stuff. Our guest this week, business analyst Michael Levy. 
and there is lots more ahead. Stay with us. The Money and Wealth Show is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Polycore Gold Corp has substantial assets. Magnesium deposit, inferred 52 billion pounds. Molybdenum deposit, indicated 1.9 million tons. Inferred 1.8 million tons of 0.087% MO. Past silver producer, average 182 ounces per ton. Trading symbol, MOR. Website, mollycore.com. Or phone me, Larry Ray, at 604-531-9639. You're watching The Money and Wealth Show, archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Here's your host, Sterling Fox. Welcome back to The Money and Wealth Show. Our special guest this week, British Columbia business analyst Michael Levy, a little less known to our viewers in Alberta, Michael, so it's important that we let people in Medicine Hat and Southern Alberta know who you are, a very well-known British Columbia business analyst and commentator. Now, let's talk precious metals since you were there already before the break. Gold and silver this week, another remarkable week. But I think you, you talked about the devaluing U.S. dollar. So while we see these spectacular numbers in gold, I think we, we need to sort of remind ourselves that these are being priced in declining U.S. dollars. That has something to do with the equation, doesn't it? Absolutely. That's why you see oil prices up. You see the precious metals up. You see other commodity prices going higher. A lot, not all of that, a lot of that is because of the decline in the U.S. dollar. And what's happening is that these commodities, including the precious metals, are making up for the decline in the U.S. dollar. So some of their advance is because the U.S. dollar is going down and they're priced in U.S. dollars. Though gold is in a bull market in every single currency, though not at record highs like against the U.S. dollar, but certainly going up and within 10 or 12 percent of record highs, whichever currency you're talking about. Now, where I want to go quickly is silver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and silver has gone Poor up. man's gold. Affordable, well, a lot more affordable to a lot more of us than the other stuff. But to me, Sterling, it's not particularly a precious metal. Okay. It's an industrial metal with a precious metal. As you say, poor man's gold, it does have a precious metal aura also. But silver has gone up what we call parabolically. So when you see a chart and a commodity steps its way up. Sure. Silver, you're looking at a rise like this, particularly mm -hmm. in the last several months. And that's very dangerous because that then tends to produce a bubble. We saw a bubble uh, in the high tech stocks uh, in 1999-2000. You saw a bubble in gold, 1978-1979-1980. And you can go, there have been different bubbles throughout uh, history and silver on a chart is looking like it's in a bubble. Interesting. And that doesn't mean it's going to fall apart. That doesn't mean the bottom's going to fall out. But what do it does mean is when the correction is there, whatever day it happened, whatever day, you're going to see more of a decline because it went up so much faster. So that which tends to go up will go beyond up comes down beyond also. John Maynard Keynes, again, the markets can remain irrational a lot longer than you can remain solvent. Interesting Silver. comment, and, yeah. and it's, it's very true. Another area that gets referred to in the context of a bubble from time to time, particularly in recent years in the United States, is real estate. Uh, they're in year six of declining property values in America, still with no bottom in sight. In Canada, certainly a much healthier real estate marketplace. But Michael, there are corrections already occurring in Canada. Well, first to the U.S. very quickly. This week, you had housing resales up significantly. But when you take a closer look, prices were down yes. from last year. That's right. So, and there's still lots of inventory. Canada's a different story. There are markets in Canada which are just making their way along, a small increase, breaking even. There are markets in Canada that are so hot, they're almost on fire. And those are the ones that give me pause for thought. And I'm talking about Vancouver, Lower Mainland, but now getting into Burnaby, now getting into South Surrey, White Rock. 
Now I'm talking about Toronto, mm -hmm. and there's a huge Asian, and I say Asian, Chinese influence that is bringing money into this market to invest and to live. But they're bringing huge amounts of money, and they are what is fueling this market. And with that, I've got to say, at this point, there is no end in sight because the money is there. There is a new entrepreneur class in China who are allowed to take money out of the country, who are buying because they want a different lifestyle, living in the nicest place in the world, or they're coming in and spending 5, 10, 15 million, well, 1, 2, 5, 10, 15 right, million right. on investment. Well, they're spending, they're spending a lot of money which is inflating the average price of homes across British Columbia, whether it's Victoria, the Okanagan, or Metro Vancouver, all of those prices go up because of the high end homes these particular Asian buyers are selecting. And that, I think, is really hard on locals who are trying to improve their lot in life. And you know what? You know what I say to them? I don't say heartlessly, too bad. You know, I mean, but what I say is, let's be realistic. Vancouver was not affordable to most people on the lower mainland 25 years ago. It's still not affordable. It may be a little bit more not affordable. <laughs> I guess, but yeah. I mean, we have mountains and we have ocean and we have boundaries. So the only place it can go is up and the condominium market is bigger than it's ever been. But Vancouver has not been an affordable city for quite a few years now. Our guest this week on the Money and Wealth Show is Michael Levy. And in just a few seconds, Michael will have the final word. The Money and Wealth Show is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Looking to advertise to targeted audiences? Online at talkdigitalnetwork.com or howstreet.com. On television, The Money and Wealth Show. And on radio, This Week in Money. To learn more about getting your message in front of our audiences, email us, info at howstreet.com, or call us, 604-699-8600. You're watching The Money and Wealth Show, archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Here's your host, Sterling Fox. And now with the final word on today's show, here's our special guest, Michael Levy. Thank you, Sterling. I've got two words, end game. You have to have an end game. Whether you're in the precious metals, whether you're in the stock market, whether you're trading currencies, You've got to know what you're going to do, when you're going to come out of the market, whether you should be taking some money off the table. Remember, if you own it, your profits are in paper only. So when the precious metals start to ease off, are you going to have taken money off the table? I want you to think about having an end game for your investments. The strategy never ends, does it, Michael? You just yeah. always got to stay on the ball. You sure do. <laughs> well, thank you for helping us to do that this week. It's just terrific to have you come by again. It's good to see you. We appreciate you dropping by. Thanks, Sterling. There's Michael Levy, and that's this edition of the Money and Wealth Show. I'm Sterling Fox. See you next time. The Money and Wealth Show has been brought to you by AmericanManganeseInc.com.